This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. several years ago when I first came, I asked, when is the all-campus graduation going to take place? And the answer was, huh? So I figured it's time to come to you and tell you a little bit about what you've accomplished over the last several years. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. So began The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, written more than a century ago. And that opening line still resonates today. This is an exciting time for you, or it should be. You've come, to the con <laughs> You've come to the conclusion that your studies at UC San Diego are behind you. You're ready to apply your knowledge to your chosen field. And yet, with a shrinking workforce, you, it is becoming more and more competitive. Fortunately for you, as you leave UC San Diego, you have a UC San Diego education. And that means something. This university has not only provided you with the skills you need for your future, we've also taught you to be good global citizens, to examine issues from a variety of perspectives, to be creators and innovators. With a UC San Diego education, you can do anything that you set your mind to. Case in point, today's keynote speaker, Mike Judge. Mike majored in physics, and then he went on to, be a, have, to have a sec successful career as the creator behind films and TV shows such as Office Space, King of the Hill, and Beavis and Butthead. I never thought I'd say that Beavis and Butthead was the beauty of a UC San Diego education. <laughs> That's what my script says, so I'm telling you. <laughs> You've learned to work across disciplines, and you have various job descriptions. I think you'll be happy that your parents should be included in that. They know that they're done paying fees. Yeah. And you should also know that UC San Diego alumni rank third in the nation in salary earnings among public universities. I also want you to know you have a support system here. You will continue to, to succeed in your future endeavors. And as you do, I hope that you will keep tap with the alumni network, take advantage of our career services, stay connected with the university. Because this is your university, where you've made memories and lifetime, lifelong friends, where you've learned and expanded your mind, where you've grown academically and as a person. This university is part of you, and you are an important part of the university. We expect to see you back on campus often. In fact, we've got exciting alumni events occurring each year, homecoming in fall, the young alumni reunion in winter, and alumni weekend in the spring. And of course, we want you to join UC San Diego's 50th anniversary celebration, which is next year. So mark your calendars, November 16, 2010. It'll be quite a show. But today, we celebrate you and your milestones. So go out there, apply the education and experience you've earned here, make a difference in your community and in the world. So now I'd like to wrap up by reading a portion of a commencement speech given by our own Dr. Seuss in 1978 at a UCSD com convention commencement. Here's how he began. I've been brought here this morning at the enormous expense of precisely $1.55, plus 19 cents more if you add on the tip to the driver who drove on this hazardous trip from the wilds of La Jolla far, far to the south so you can hear wisdom pour forth from my mouth. It's been brought here to warn you of stress and strife that you'll face as you bravely ride forth into life, such as the lamentable instability of your fast-shrinking dollars 
and the current crisis in the market, marketability of kangaroo collars. You'll be faced with the problems of armament treaties, and would Bruce Jenner would have won the Olympics had he failed to eat his Wheaties. I'm going to skip a little bit. <laughs> I'm throwing the rest of my compendium away. I'll say one single good thing I can say. As you leap on your horses and enter the fray, I wish you good luck and an hasta luego. From UC La Jolla, I mean San Diego. <laughs> good luck and congratulations. It gives me great, great pleasure at this time to introduce to you our, our, alum, our alumnus speaker, Mike Judge. We've been waiting for this day for many, many, many months. Um, as Chancellor Fox mentioned, uh, Mike has, uh, has created so many incredible films, TV series. He's an Emmy Award winner. Uh, but many of you probably will also recognize his voice and see his face as he's appeared in many, many of his films. Um, I think you're in for a great treat. Uh, we've had the, the pleasure of having Mike with us all day, visiting various parts of campus, meeting with students and faculty. And one of the things that just came out so clearly to all of us is that although he's this creative genius and really truly symbolizes what a UCSD alumni is all about, what being an alumnus is about uh, through his creativity, what he's always demonstrated to do through his work is to show what is the, the sense of compassion in very seemingly ordinary ways through his characters. So for that, we appreciate him and we're very proud to call him a member of our alumni family. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Judge. Thank you. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> graduating class of 2009. <laughs> okay. Uh. <laughs> Now that I've got that over with, um, I'll do the rest of the speech in my normal voice. Boy, I tell you what, class of 2009, faculty, alumni, and friends, it is indeed my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. <clears throat> yeah, man, I tell you what, man, dang old, man, dang old Chancellor Fox, man, me damn talking about you guys and them dang old, thank you very much, man. <clears throat> okay. I wanted to see how he was going to sign Boomhauer. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, I know I probably wasn't asked to speak here because of my political views on the Middle East or my philosophical contemplations on where the soul ends and the man begins. I was probably asked here to, uh, to speak because of the dumb laugh I did. And so I, I won't go on too long. Um, I was, uh, I was talking to a lot of the students today, and um, I know that jobs are kind of on everyone's mind, and um, a lot of people are asking me, like, you know, how do I break into entertainment business, movies, TV, how do I become a comedy writer? And what I usually tell them is the first thing you want to do is major in physics. Um, <clears throat> So I'll tell you a quick version of the, uh, my humble story of uh, my crooked path from graduating with a degree in physics here in 85 from this fine university to creating what is widely considered to be one of the dumbest shows in the history of television. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be a, a lesson in there somewhere. <laughs> um, there you go. Uh, um, when I started here uh, in the Warren dorms 28 years ago, I don't know, is Portola Hall still there? <laughs> I, was, uh, I was very intimidated by San Diego and California in general. I, I remember in, uh, during Welcome Week, um, this girl who actually was the chancellor's daughter uh, asked, she said, oh, where are you from? And um, I said, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And she said, <laughs> no, really, where are you from? <laughs> And I, I, was, I was very, uh, kind of had this, I was intimidated. I'd always had this dream about going into comedy and, 
animation, sketch comedy, maybe I'd always done imitations of teachers and stuff, but I didn't think that that was a possibility for me. I didn't have any connections. I was from Albuquerque, uh, you know. Um, so I went and got my degree in physics. And uh, I graduated in 1985, and my generation, I think uh, high school guidance counselors and adults in general had us all convinced that if you got a degree in science, jobs would just come raining out of the sky. We were just like, <laughs> you'd get like, it would solve all the world's problems if we all had degrees in science, because there wouldn't be any world hunger. Everyone would have a job at Motorola. We'd be driving Corvettes. And I, I bought into this, and I didn't even, I was, I did, <laughs> yeah, I'll get to, maybe I'll get to that. Um, I, uh, anyway, I didn't do any on-campus interviews. I, I, was, I was golden boy with my physics degree. I just thought I was gonna get a job. And uh, well, it turns out that wasn't true at all, uh, at least not for me. And to make things worse, um, I'd moved into this, I was subletting this room from a friend of mine who was traveling abroad. So I'd paid him all the rent for the summer and uh, what he didn't tell me was that his roommate was dealing speed. And uh, apparently not a very successful speed, speed dealer because he hadn't paid the rent. So we were being evicted. So here, I'd, I'd paid all my rent to a guy who was off in Egypt. And I was having to dodge process servers and all this stuff. So I had the experience of being evicted without getting to have the experience of not paying rent. I. Uh, and then, so this guy also, he hadn't paid the, uh, the phone bill, and this was before cell phones, so all, the f all my resumes I'd sent out had this phone number on it, and it got shut off. Um, so, uh, by the way, you wanna know where that speed dealer is today? <laughs> Sitting right on this stage, ladies and gentlemen, Vice Chancellor Armin Afsad. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I also know if, if Armin was to deal speed, I think he would be very successful at it. I think he's a, the compassion he shows. <clears throat> um, so uh, anyway, um, my last $200 was stolen. Actually, I had $50 in my pocket. I hit rock bottom, couldn't get a job because didn't have a phone. Um, I think there's a song about that. Anyway, um, I. I had a little bit of a break. I started playing bass with this drunken redneck guy, blues guy named Blonde Bruce. I, I hope he's not still playing. Um, and uh, I managed to get enough money to get the phone put back on just in time to just barely get a job. So I was, uh, you know, in August of 85, you wouldn't find anybody as happy to have this job as I was. And, and uh, until about maybe three or four days in when I was, I just, kind of, it kind of hit me like, wow, this, uh, so this is it. This was, uh, you know, I'd had a ton of jobs. I mean, I'd worked everything from being a paper boy to Jack in the Box, uh, Physics TA, Muir Cafeteria. Um, I was gonna pause for applause for the Muir Cafeteria, I wasn't sure. Uh, <laughs> um, but you know, this was supposed to be the good job. This was, uh, and I actually did, I did like the people I worked with, but you know, Something about uh, my destiny wasn't in my control, and I got, I, I liked these people I was working with, then I got transferred into this different group, and I was in this room with uh, a bunch of really weird guys, middle-aged, uh, creepy, I'm middle-aged now, but you know, I was <laughs> 22 at the time. Um, there was one guy, I, I asked him, uh, I just, he just never said anything, I, I kind of wondered about him, and I just, said, uh, one day I just said, hey, how's it going? I won't say what his name is. And he just started saying this thing about like, um, if they move my desk one more time, I'm quitting. And, and I was by the window and I had opened the floodgates and he went on about his fish tank and how, and he had a, uh, I think he had a mail order bride I had heard actually. Then um, I didn't want to know anything more about him. I, I then, uh, so then I, I quit that job. I moved to the Bay Area mostly to uh, follow my girlfriend at the time, who would later become my wife and then later my ex-wife. <laughs> she was also a UCSD graduate in physics. 
Now, th this was in, in the mid-'80s. Uh, the Bay Area was just, it was just overachiever fever. The whole, like, um, that mentality was just really intense. And it was in ground zero for it was Silicon Valley. And I remember, this was before the internet, you'd look for jobs in the paper. I don't know if you guys still do. Um, there, my son, Sun Microsystems had an entire page ad the front in giant letters it just said push and then underneath it it said yourself harder than you ever dreamed possible past all existing goals up to the level of Sun Microsystems and this scared me and disturbed me I just I, <laughs> I was looking at this and, and I thought because I don't dream about pushing myself harder than I thought possible I dream about like sitting on the beach in Hawaii with a beer or you know, place out in the country, and, and uh, so I was kind of like looking at this guy. What do I do? And then I ended up getting this job at this place at Parallax, called Parallax, and I was again grateful for my job. I, I get there the first day, and it was like I was walking into this bizarre cult. It, it was a company of about 50 people, and everybody was already there when I got there. There was I got there 10 minutes early. It was my first day, and and then. Um, I had no rapport with anybody. I couldn't relate to anybody. Nobody was sitting around just, you know, having any idle conversation. And so I, um, around, by the time lunchtime came around, I actually left for, my deal was eight to six with an hour for lunch. Well, nobody left for lunch except for me that first day. And I, I, I was just counting the hours until six o'clock. And then six o'clock rolls around, everybody's still there. Like nobody's leaving. And 6.30 and then seven, and this guy, Hilden, who was just on me all day, like he comes over and goes, okay, uh, now I'm gonna get you started on the RTs, and uh, we're gonna And I was just, wanted to go home. And uh, <laughs> at 7.30, I finally just made up an excuse that I had to pick up someone from the airport, and I went home, and then I realized, wow, this, this is just Monday. And I still have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then the next week, and then the rest of my life, until I retire, and uh, so um, I ended up uh, calling in sick the following Monday. And then Tuesday, the, one of my many bosses, I had like five or 10 of them, I don't know, comes by and he goes, hmm, yeah. Uh, so you were sick yesterday, huh? I said, yeah, yeah, I was sick. Hmm, did you have a cold or something? And, uh, and it turned into the most passive-aggressive conversation I've ever been in. And uh, I lasted there about two and a half, three months. I probably called in sick three more Mondays after that. So anyway, after this, uh, one more engineering job. And then I kind of figured I shouldn't be wasting these people's time. And uh, I threw in the towel on that. I'd always been a musician, so I, I uh, started doing that full time. And, that, again, you know, I, I, I wasn't a singer or songwriter, so my destiny wasn't in my control. It was in the control of whatever drunken hillbilly was running the band. I was in Dallas, uh, toured around. Uh, this time, I was married in Dallas, and it was around this time that I had a life-changing moment, actually kind of two life-changing moments. The first one was I had this premonition that I was going to get a, into a car wreck, and the steering wheel was going to go through my testicles. And, <laughs> So then I did get in a car wreck. I was hit by a drunk driver, but I was okay down there. And this <laughs> led me to talk my wife into having our first daughter immediately. <laughs> and, uh, and around the same time, the other big life-changing moment, I went to an uh, animation festival, animation show. And uh, there's still some of these. I'm sure some of you guys have been, like the Spike and Mike one and whatever. Um, this one was called The Animation Celebration. It was playing in Dallas. And I'd been to all of these, and I was, I'd always wanted to do animation and separately go into comedy. What was different here is they had a, there was a local guy in Dallas. This was filmed from all over the world who had one of his shorts had made it into this festival. And he had his drawings and his cells on display in the lobby. And it was something about seeing those and, and just going, realizing, OK, there's a guy right here in my town doing this. And He's, you know, there must be a camera you can rent time on. And just the reality of that all hit me all at once, like just a ton of bricks. And just suddenly, 
for the first time, I, I was motivated. I was a man on a mission. And, you know, I, actually for the first time, I kind of understood that thing, push yourself harder <laughs> than you ever thought possible. I was, and I was still a musician at the time, and I was, you know, musician hours, the earliest I would wake up would be noon. And anything earlier than that was just really tough. But I woke up the next morning at 8.30 just on my own. And from then on, I was just, I just worked my butt off at it. I was just, I, I, I knew what I wanted to do. I was motivated. I went to the library. I got books on it. Um, and I got a little Bolex, $200 Bolex camera and just started animating. And it, it sounds kind of nerdy maybe and a little weird, but like I, I, I think this was probably the happiest I've ever been. The success that came later was really nice, but something about just toiling away and just doing those hundreds of drawings and being on a mission and knowing that there were these possibilities was, was uh, and having something that motivated me after going through all these jobs that I didn't like uh, was great. I also had a, you know, my wife at the time was not only supportive, but she had a job that she liked, and uh, it was a good backstop. Um, so I ended up, I, I finished this, but the first short I finished was called Office Space, and it was uh, uh, about two minutes long, took me about eight weeks to animate it. Uh, and so I had this thing, and I, you know, again, I have no connections in show business, so that's the part I always miss when I'm watching somebody talk about how they made it on TV there's always this big section missing of how do you how do you break in you know and I didn't know how to I actually was kind of embarrassed that I did this I just called 411 and just said uh, MTV please and uh, I literally called uh, Comedy Central MTV animation festivals and uh, that's the press follow me everywhere I go um, I called, I called these places, and, and you know, of course, you know these. Some of these receptionists are kind of mean, and it's their big opportunity to be mean to somebody. But I just, you know, I, I just kept asking for addresses, and I just mailed out like 12 VHS tapes. And within a week or two, I got calls from Comedy Central, a show called Kids in the Hall, a show called. Uh, Night After Night with Alan Havey, I got the animation festivals, and it was just like, I couldn't believe it. And I, my first thought was, man, why didn't I do this when I was 19? What, I, like, I went and got a physics degree, I had all those jobs. I did, like, um, but then as, as my career went on, I realized it's a really good thing I didn't do that because I, for one thing, I got all that comedy material from all those jobs and all, you know, and, and in fact, it kind of became my trademark. I think a lot of people in entertainment come from kind of upper class backgrounds and go straight into film school. And a lot of the movies are about other movies. And, or, and so I kind of was able to find this niche of doing stuff that was about real life. And also, having all those you know, jobs I didn't like, I had an appreciation uh, for what I do now. Um, and then it was just a matter of just you know working hard and and putting up with Hollywood and battling Hollywood and just you know persevering. Now, as the guy as the guy who made Office Space, I and you're you're all graduating. I, I want to be careful. I don't want to say too many bad things about jobs because I've probably done enough damage already. Um, and in fact, when Beavis and Butthead and King of the Hill became shows, I had employees of my own, probably as many as 70 to 90, and. I began to sympathize with my former bosses and uh, realized it must have been pretty frustrating to have someone like me as an employee. Uh, but I, I would point out, I heard somebody talking about this on CNBC, it, it, which is that the job is a fairly recent concept in human history. It used to be that you know, you'd be the blacksmith in the village or you'd be the guy who makes horseshoes or furniture. And you know, business was good or business was bad, but you weren't worried about unemployment. You know, like the Vikings weren't worried about unemployment and <laughs> jobs. And and I think in tough economic times, if you can't find a job, or if you find, like I did, that you just don't like most of the jobs, I would encourage you to go back to that older way of thinking. You know, find something people need or want. Um, willing to pay for. I found that people needed and wanted to watch two dumbass teenagers sitting on the couch watching bad music videos, you know. 
Hopefully you'll find something more high-minded, I guess. Um, but tough economic times like this have inspired people to do really great things and start their own businesses and find new ways, you know, to, to do business. And uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with jobs. And, and, you know, when you work for other people, it can actually be really fulfilling and exactly what you're looking for. So don't listen to me. And if you find that, that's great. And I hope that a lot of you have jobs lined up. Um, but just, you know, there is another path to take, and if you take that path, it's really, it's hard work, and you'll be right sometimes, you'll be wrong sometimes. Um, you know, people will doubt you, you'll doubt yourself, but if you're doing something you want and have a passion for, or if you're working towards doing something you want or have a passion for, at least you'll have that to guide you. And you should also know there are a lot of mean, stupid bosses out there, uh, but there are also some really good ones who do good things, and. When you work for other people, you'll find that um, they do know what's best for them and for the company. And you should listen to them and be respectful, but they don't know what's best for you. Only you know that. And whether you're working for yourself or someone else, you should always try to find that and know that. Um, 24 years ago, I was sitting right there, or maybe it was over there, uh, listening to um, you know what, I don't remember who was giving the commencement <laughs> speech or anything they said. Uh, so, you know, maybe 24 years from now, one of you will be standing up here giving the commencement speech and forgetting who I am. Uh, this was a great day for me back then. I hope it's a great day for you. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to have been asked to be here, and I'm honored to have you all join me as fellow alumni of UC San Diego. So let's raise a glass and watch some fireworks. Fire, fire. Thank you.